Welcome back everyone to a new video. Today we're going to be taking a look at some epic Skulk sensor contraptions that I've made with Green Jab. These are extremely cool. For example, this touch screen display. Green's going to draw a little smiley face for us here. Now this uses a, a sort of triangulation. Pretty much the Skulk sensors each detect where Green Jab is, and then they output a signal strength relative to the distance that he is away from the sensor. And then those three signal strengths get compared against programmed values. And if all three values line up with the inputs, then they produce an output. And in this case, the piston retracts, activates this, this observer line, and then toggles these doors. If you come up here, you can see all the trapdoors flickering up and down really fast. The observers detect those trapdoors and then output. Okay, so now that we know how that works, we're going to show you some core mechanics of the Skulk sensor because there's a few of them to go through. It's a pretty complicated block, but we're going to try and break it down as best we can. We're currently playing in the new 1.17 snapshots, where we have the new Skulk sensor. This is a new redstone component, which detects actions in the space near it. There are two outputs to the Skulk sensor, that being a redstone line or a comparator output. When you connect the redstone line directly to the Skulk sensor, it shows the distance from the Skulk sensor. The closer you are to the sensor, the higher the output. When you attach the comparator to the Skulk sensor, it detects different actions. For instance, when you walk, it only has an output of one. But for instance, casting a fishing rod has a higher output. As you can see in the diagram here, a skulk sensor by itself detects an action, but it only knows how far away it is, not where it is. With two sensors, we can bring that down to two locations. And then with three, we can bring it down to just one location. And then that's the output that we use to detect where the player is. So this tech allows us to create the first seamless survival-friendly touchscreen display in Minecraft. This is the reset switch. So if you accidentally draw on the display, you can reset it at any time. And then this note block here locks it. So if I jump around, do whatever, no inputs are going to be produced because these repeaters over here lock the pistons. If I go over here, repeaters are on, pushes down the piston constantly. So it doesn't matter if all three of these torches turn off, the piston's still going to stay extended. In order to get this to work, we needed to make a very compact system of being able to detect exactly the right output which we need. For instance, when we throw a snowball or any other projectile, the Skulk sensor, when it's caught up to a comparator, will receive an output of 7. By putting an input of 6 into this lectern, when we throw the snowball, the lantern lights up. But if we do something else, for instance, doing using a fishing hook, the output is too strong, and it cancels out the output. If the, in if the input is too weak, it will get cancelled by the lectern. By putting three of these stacked together and connecting them via an AND gate, when, when using the triangulation, if all three of the Skulk sensor inputs are correct for this NAND gate, then the whole output will activate and we can then send the signal back to the display and turn that pixel on. Now after the player draws on the display and the outputs are compared, the signal then gets sent along one of 49 wires which are connected up to the display. As you can see there, the piston retracted, which then set a signal along these wires, all the way across here, and then down along here, goes all the way along, up to this pixel, and then over here. So green was standing on this circuit, if I jump on here, we should see this piston retracts, that one there, you saw it, the signal gets sent along and the pixel turns on. Then of course if you want to reset it you just hit that. It's got this quick satisfying little reset. And using this rail trick with the rails going through the blocks like this, we were actually able to reduce the latency by 0.1 seconds on average. And this is huge when considering just how big this is. Margins like that are actually considerable. As you may have figured out already, the difference between the front and back pixels is around 2 seconds. This is because of all the extra distance that it has to travel, with the main delay coming from the comparators that are preserving the redstone signal as it travels along the circuit. 
While designing this farm, we aimed to make the system as responsive as possible, and in doing so, we made DisplayPort 2.1, which is four times faster vertically than conventional observer chains, and three times faster horizontally. This isn't completely new tech, but it is a slight improvement over previous iterations. Just for reference, this here is DisplayPort 1.0, Pretty much it's just a bunch of observers detecting each other and then outputting onto a display. Very simple, but also extremely slow and laggy. This here is our very first design. It outputted to an external display which added even more delay and had outdated red and yellow circuits. As you can see over here, we had to use two pistons to extend the signal down instead of having the signal up here and then it just travels down over time. And that adds a little bit more delay. But the main difference between our first design and others is this section here. Labeled as the CPU, this section encoded all the even signal inputs into decimal form, and those values were then compared. We later realized that you can just compare the raw inputs straight from the sensor, and so we did, removing this eyesore. With this new tech, Green and I were able to create a combination lock that produces over a billion combinations with just four inputs used. And when 33 are used, it creates even more combinations than there are atoms in the universe. For this combination lock, there are 49 position inputs, along with 12 action inputs you can do. You have to get the positions and the actions in the correct order in order to open this door. This design is also infinitely tileable, and can therefore have just as many inputs. Now of course, having Google Plexi into the power of G64 inputs wouldn't be practical, it is still fun to theorize. We start the inputs with the four different position locks, as we have seen beforehand with the touchscreen. If all four of these are activated in the correct order, by having the first one start a infinite signal and each one after that only extending the signal, if all four of them got activated, it will then pulse this piston and place a block here in this chain. Blue circuit here is detecting the actions of the skulk signal. We first have a shift register, so we only activate one of the four different strength detectors. If each strength detector detects the correct signal, it will then pulse these blocks into these positions. And once it reaches the end, it then pulses the signal back through here, and if each of these blocks were placed because they were correct. The signal makes it all the way to this rail, which then goes up, activates the RS NOR latch, which then opens the door. This 7x7 vault door was designed by RKF Walter. You can find the tutorial for it in the description below. Of course, this can also be used as an item selection panel. You land on the blocks that you want, and within a matter of seconds, you receive them. No switches or a chest to sort through. This is currently a prototype, and item sorters and various shulker systems still need to be added in for it to be fully viable for a survival world or server. Now, I'll be lying to you if I told you that this system is completely flawless. There is one minor issue with it. If you stand on this block, like that, or its mirror, then you'll get two outputs. This only occurs because the skulk's output is the same signal regardless of which block you're standing on. So if I stand on here, it's going to output 14, and if I stand on here, it's still going to output 14. This is represented over here. To fix our duplicate pixel problem, I have proposed a solution. Currently, the SCOG sensors only output even numbers for the distances apart from 15 and 1 for the very close and far blocks. However, if we allow the SCOG sensor to also output odd numbers on the blocks which are technically further away, that's on the Skulk sensor, we'll be able to increase the accuracy of the distance and therefore increase the accuracy of which pixel needs to be activated, therefore fixing our duplicate problem. Currently, we can only draw on the display every 40 game ticks, which is rather slow compared to real-life touchscreens where you can input once every 4 milliseconds. I suggest lowering this from 40 game ticks to 10 or 15. This offers multiple benefits, with the main one being simply you can always increase the cooldown of a pulse, but you can never decrease it. One proposed idea we had was to, instead of searching for pre-programmed outputs, 
Instead, we take the direct outputs from the stroke sensor and put them through a whole analog calculator to properly triangulate the location of where the player was. I started work here on an analog adder and an analog subtractor, and hopefully in future we can build this into a full analog calculator so that we can properly triangulate the positions of where the player is. Finally, I would just like to say Green Jab again for being such a legend and helping out with this project so much. If you would like to play around with these yourself, the world download is over on my Discord, and if you have any questions or feedback on these designs, leave a comment below and I'll be more than happy to reply. Anyways, thanks for watching to the end of the video and have an awesome day. See ya!